He's also an affiliate faculty of the Copyright X program, which is a course offered each year from January to May under the auspices of Harvard Law School, the Harvard X Distance Learning Initiative, and the Berkman Klein Center for Inter Internet and Society, Harvard University. Dr. Scaria is currently working on projects in the areas of open science, open innovation, and regulation of digital markets in the context of big data, AI, and IoT. So, so with so many feathers to his cap, let us welcome him and let us take as much as we can from his insights and his deliberations. Over to you, Professor uh, Scaria. So thanks to uh, Shivanada University and Dr. Vinita for organizing this. And I would like to start today's presentation with a short opinion poll. So let me uh, just show you the details of that poll. And I would request all of you to participate in that poll because I also want to know some of your perspectives on the three questions which I have uh, put in that particular uh, poll. So yeah, let me first show you the details. Um, I hope you can see the slide, right? So yeah. essentially you will have to go to menti.com and you need to type in the code 5912940. I repeat, 5912940. So you can access it from your phone or laptop, whatever it might be. Just go to menti.com and then type in this particular code. So three very short questions. And let me also tell you there are no right or wrong answers there. So please answer with whatever is coming to your mind first. Hmm? So the first question uh, is, when you hear the term artificial intelligence, what are the three things? It could be emotion, it could be objects, it could be activities, it could be anything else uh, that comes to your mind. So please put in three keywords that come to your mind when you hear the term artificial intelligence. Yeah, very interesting. Futuristic technology, electronic devices, ease of use, Alexa, Learning, robot, Siri, Elon Musk, <laughs> automation. Yeah, go ahead. I would like to hear from all 29 of you. I, I think yeah, now there are more than 29. So please, yeah, type in three. And if anyone joined just now, please um, uh, go to menti.com and just type in the code 5912940. So that's the first question. Uh, the second one is uh, a statement that is intellectual property rights should protect a created works and innovation. So if you think yes, yes, put in yes. If you don't think it should be protected by IP rights, then no. If you don't want to take a position, you can also put I don't know. Again, I re-emphasize there are no right or wrong answers here. I am just trying to get your perspectives on this particular issue. We'll be discussing uh, the merits as well as demerits of IP protection in this area in detail, but I just want to hear uh, your perspectives before you uh, we start. Uh, the third one is also an important one, that is transparency is important with regard to the manner in which AI works. So if you think transparency is an integral or should be an integral component of AA, uh, then please put yes. If you don't think it's that important, you can put no. If you don't want to take a position, you can also put I don't know. Hmm. Uh, interestingly, when uh, Dr. Krishna was sharing the uh, demographics, I noticed that uh, there are people from all kinds of disciplines, and I was particularly thrilled to see that there are people from computer science and uh, computer science, mechanical engineering, etc. So it's a very diverse set of audience. So I would like to know your perspectives on this issue, and I could imagine that some of you might also be working on AI-related technologies, right? So that makes it even more um, important. So 
I guess so far only around seven people have participated. <laughs> so I I want to see more results coming. Are there only seven people who are listening? <laughs> Anyway, so what I would do is I'll keep this poll open and maybe I would request uh, Dr. Krishna to just put on the chat box uh, the code. So just put menti.com okay. okay, and okay. Uh, also type in this code so that maybe we can also come back to this poll towards the end of our presentation. But uh, who is participating, I would like them to participate in this particular poll. Hmm? Okay, so while uh, I mean some of you might be still on the poll, uh, I would like to continue with my uh, presentation. So it is beyond doubt today that AI is touching almost every aspect of our life. Uh, be it, say for example, the mail you send. So when you say for example, start a mail uh, or composing a mail on Gmail, you will start seeing suggestions coming from Gmail. So there an AI is working. Or when you order a cab over Uber, you will see the Uber algorithm deciding which driver should be matched to you. There again, you are seeing um, a working. Or when you shop things on Amazon or Flipkart, whatever it might be, again, you can see a working. So these are just three examples, but it is a fact that a is touching almost every aspect of our life today. And when we move to the next era of Internet of Things, I am sure that the role of A in our lives are going to be even more important. And this has also resulted in profound and fundamental challenges for law and social policy. And this is particularly important in the area of intellectual property. So when Dr. Krishna was sending me the topic, A and IP, I was thinking about what are the different possible interfaces of IP with A. And I see three major kinds of interfaces. So the first one is A as a tool for IP management. So in the last, I think, four days, you have learned about different areas of intellectual property. And I also see from the program that you also had things like um, IP management and also things like prior art uh, search, et cetera, right? So I do feel that A can be an important tool in different aspects of IP management. The second area of interface is the role of intellectual property as a tool for protecting A or works generated by A. So that's the second level of interface which I see between A and IP. The third interface which I can see is IP as an obstacle to innovation and transparency in A. So these are the three major areas of interface of IP with A. And in today's presentation, I will be focusing on these different areas. Of course, they are not going to be receiving equal importance. The most of our discussion will be focusing on the second aspect, that is IP as a tool for protecting A or A generated work. If you look at the relationship on all these three areas, you can very clearly see that a is influencing IP and IP can influence A. Sometimes overlaps can be beneficial, sometimes overlaps can also be conflicting. And through today's presentation, of course, we don't have that much time. We only have around one hour or 15 minutes for this particular uh, presentation. I won't be able to touch upon all areas, but at least you should be able to uh, get to know some of the important questions in this particular area. So let's look at the first interface, which I would say is also the least controversial interface, that is A as a tool for IP management. 
next. So when we look at the role of AI in IT management, you can already notice that the patent officers or IT officers in general across the world have started using AI in different areas. AI is considered as a particularly important or useful tool in terms of document verification, in terms of prior art search, and if it, you are dealing with design application, I think you also had a session on designs, right? If I understand correctly, if you had a design search, yes, it's important to also search for novelty in designs, and there again, that image search is important. There also, A can play a very important role. Then another area where AI can play an important role is translating documents. So when it comes to prior art search, sometimes the difficulty which a patent office might be facing is that the material is not available in the language known for or familiar for the patent examiner. So in those cases, maybe AI can be used in the translation of documents also. So in all these areas, I mean, of, of course, I have listed here only four uh, things but there can be many other areas. You can see that A can be a very, very useful tool for the IP office as well as people engaging in IP management. Of course, there are also some challenges in this regard. The most important one being, if you are using A for decision-making, there is also a very high probability that there might be some bias in the decision-making because at the end, Whatever AI is producing, it is a kind of reflection of people who coded the AI. So whatever bias the individual had, that will definitely be reflecting in the decision-making of the AI also. So it is very important to ensure that those kinds of biases are avoided when we use AI as a tool for IP management, particularly when you decide the fate of application submitted in an IP office. So at least the principles of natural justice should be upheld and there should be a right of hearing by a human being for all the applicants. So even if A is making the preliminary decision, I would always suggest that yes, it should be overseen by an official who is working in the patent office. So that's very important in uh, this particular interface. Uh, any questions on this interface? By the way, you are free to ask me questions uh, in between, so you don't have to wait till the end of the presentation. Uh, but we can also uh, certainly dedicate some amount of time towards the end of the presentation for uh, Q&A. So please feel free to interrupt at any point of time. And I must also add here that I'm seeing this more as a conversation rather than as a one-way uh, lecture, because there are more unanswered questions rather than uh, several questions in this uh, area. Okay, so, if there are no... One yes. point, Hula, please. Yes. Uh, what are the practical examples of use of AI, AI in uh, this uh, field? Are there any uh, startups or any such enterprises which are working from so the Indian there uh, are, perspective? So in the Indian context, a couple of um, weeks or months back, the Indian Patent Office had invited applications um, uh, suggesting the potential applications for AA in the um, IP management at our IP office. So I'm not sure whether we have shortlisted any firm, any startup for helping the IP office in managing this. But if you look at the other patent offices across the world, say for example, Japanese patent office or the US patent office, you can already see A being used at different levels. And as I mentioned earlier, a is particularly useful when it comes to things like image search. For example, it is very, very difficult for a human being to scan through, say, 10,000 images and then check whether this image is similar to the application which we have received for a design um, protection. But for A, it's just a matter of seconds. So that's one area where there is an extensive practical application. Of course, um, in the Indian context also, I am sure that some of the startups might have already started working in this area, but we might have to wait for some more time to see how our patent office is going to uh, utilize the help of those, um, um, I would say, uh, startups. But maybe just one um, additional point which I should um, uh, mention here. 
so in the case of case management for example as you know uh, there are judgments are produced by different courts across the country right and most of the judgments from high courts and supreme court are reportable decisions so at the moment there are different ai applications and the, one of the most prominent ones is case mine uh, which will give you the results so if you ask that particular um, ai what are the relevant cases in the area of say for example novelty in india novelty with respect to patent applications in india that will pull up all the relevant uh, applications so you just have to put it in your natural language and it will uh, give you the most important results and it will also show you which um, uh, of those decisions have been overruled and why those uh, decisions have been overruled but again i reemphasize uh, we'll see a lot more applications in the coming years in the indian context even though uh, this field has uh, moved far ahead in many of the other jurisdictions i hope i answered your query is that clear yes thank you uh, yeah okay. it's clear i was uh... Okay. Okay. No problem. So, if that's the case, yes. Let's move to the next one, the next interface, which I think is a most controversial one. That is use of intellectual property as a tool for protecting AI or AI-generated works. So, as you can see here, I am making a very clear distinction between protection of AI and protection of AI-generated works. and that's for a reason which you will see in the upcoming uh, um, uh, slide so with respect to protection of ai i can say that there may not be that much controversy because it's very clear that it is set of programmers who are coding the ai and we are already giving protection for software right because when i think you already had a session on copyright law and as part of the session you must have learned that a software is a subject matter of copyright protection so when it comes to protection of ai since they are essentially algorithms yes there isn't much controversy about whether that should be protected but the more interesting question from a legal and philosophical perspective is whether we should protect the works generated by ai so in this regard it is also a good idea to look at what are some of the ai generated works that the world has seen in the last couple of months so let's see some examples so i think 2 3 weeks back the guardian published an op-ed open editorial and guardian publishes many open editorial but this one was different because that particular op-ed was entirely written by a robot so basically the guardian editors all what they did was they told the system that yes we need to write a an op-ed and that too an op-ed on why a is not a threat to humanity and then the ai started producing different op-eds on that particular topic finally if you read that particular op-ed and i would strongly encourage all of you to read that um, in any case i will be sharing these slides later so you can just click on that particular link and then read that particular op-ed and in the methodology section you will see the guardian specifically mentioning that what they did was they essentially picked two three of the best op-eds that were produced by this particular uh, system and then they combined it and then produced this particular op-ed so there was some amount of human intervention there in terms of that selection and that compilation but overall this particular op-ed was uh, generated by uh, the uh, algorithm only so this is one example and in the ordinary context as you might have learned from your copyright session this would definitely be protected as a literary work so the one of the questions that you should ask yourself is should this particular opet which was produced by the robot be protected by copyright law so i think that's one question you need to ask yourself 
but that's not the only example so if you look at other major newspapers across the world you will see that most of them have started using a for reporting for example bloomberg new service is using or at least some sort of automated services for almost one third of the news reporting which it is doing uh one of the examples in this particular regard is a algorithm called cyborg which is making reports on the company earnings report so in every quarter um the companies the firms have to produce a company earning report generally it's a very very boring task for a reporter to go through those figures and then prepare a a uh, news report but now thanks to cyborg it is producing it quickly the moment company earnings reports are published by firms similarly the associated press can be using it extensively for reporting minor league baseball the washington post is using it for high school football the los angeles times is using it for reporting on earthquakes and forbes has gone even one step further and their system which is known as berti is producing rough drafts and story templates for reporters so if the particular reporter has gone and collected certain facts what the berti will be doing is it will create the first draft based on the story templates which they have and then the reporters only need to work further on the particular draft and if you would like to see an example for a machine generated article from the associated press you can see it on this slide uh, wherein you can see how the particular algorithm has actually reported on uh, the uh, earning again so these are examples wherein you can see the a producing works which might ordinarily be protected as a literary work under copyright law but he has been stopped there in reporting uh, just factual thing in some cases it has gone further so in the next slide what you are seeing is a joint project of google stanford university and university of massachusetts wherein they used recurrent neural network language model and produce poetry <laughs> so if you can look at the slide you will see one poem right and i would say it's not that bad for example i cannot write something which is as good as uh, this so what you are seeing on the screen is a poem which is being produced through this particular project not bad right again as you might recall a work like this is generally i mean if it was produced by a human being it is a subject matter of copyright law but again a hasn't stopped there and let me show you another example so for that i need to actually show you one short or uh, one minute video clipping so let me just show you that one hmm? Okay so can everyone see the screen and also hear the sound Yes yes Sir Yes So how is the music? Are there any musicians in this group? Uh, I didn't see it in the demographic profile, but um, uh, Dr. Krishna, are there anyone from the music background? No, not exactly. Oh, that's, so sorry. That's unfortunate. But how was the music? Yeah, I think nice it was. One. 
It reminded me of my school days. It reminded me of my school days. I studied with the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, Kentucky. So it reminded me of my okay. sisters playing the piano and the Very, music. Yes. Yeah. So most of us have heard the music uh, or the different music. And what you heard here is essentially the music produced by A from listening different music produced by Bach. So that's the reason why they have called it as Deep Bach. So this came from an ERC uh, funded project called uh, Flow Machines Project. And yes, it is producing music which is very similar to the one uh, that were produced by Bach. Amazing, right? Now let's, so as you can, again, I mean, as you might have um, noticed from your copyright related session, Music is a subject matter of copyright. So if this music was produced by Bach, yes, it would have been under copyright uh, protection. So if any of us produce music like this, yes, we would generally be getting copyright protection. But now, yes, we need to ask ourselves, should we give copyright protection for this particular music? So that's one question you need to ask. Let me also show you another uh, important video because A has been stopped with poetry or music it has gone even a bit further so i would like you to see this short video also one of his great achievements one of Rembrandt's great achievements was to portray human emotions in a much more convincing way than artists had before him and in many ways for all time IG, we believe in the power of innovation, what it can mean to people. We want to bring this innovative spirit to our sponsorship of Dutch art and culture. We knew that for this challenge, we needed to team up with experts from various fields to make this come to life. We're using a lot of data to improve business life. But we haven't been using data that much in a way that touches the human soul. You could say that we use technology and data like Rembrandt used his paints and his brushes to create something new. The first step was to study the works of Rembrandt in order to create an extensive database. We gathered the data from his collection of paintings from many different sources, including 3D scans and upscale images using a deep learning algorithm. Because a significant percentage of Rembrandt paintings were portraits, we analyzed the demography of the faces in these paintings, looking at factors for gender, age, and head direction. The data led us to the conclusion that the subject should be a portrait of a Caucasian male with facial hair between 30 and 40 years old, in dark clothing with a collar, wearing a hat, and facing to the right. From there, we started to extract features only with faces that were related to that specific profile. And we had to create a whole painting from just data. And we used uh, statistical analysis and various algorithms to extract the features that make Rembrandt Rembrandt. We took parts of the face and we started to compare them. And then based on this, we were able to create a typical Rembrandt eye or nose or mouth or ear. After generating the features, we were focusing on the face proportions. We used an algorithm that can detect over 60 points in a painting. We were able to align the faces and to estimate the distance between the eyes, the nose and the mouth and the ears. A painting is not a 2D picture. It's 3D. You can see the canvas, you can see the process, and that's what makes the painting come alive. A hive map is essential to make the painting a painting. We incorporated the hive map into the painting and printed on a 3D printer that uses a special paint-based UV ink. It printed many layers, one on top of the other, which resulted in the height and texture of the final painting. It's 
sometimes a magical moment to see a painting for the first time, even if it's computer generated. For me, it is something special. I would have believed if I would saw it in a museum that it would have been a, a real Rembrandt, uh, just one I haven't seen before. It will be interesting to see Rembrandt looking at it. He will be happy that there are people trying to understand him and trying to create something out of that. So I think he will be happy. The next Rembrandt makes you think about where innovation can take us. What's next? Again, very interesting, right? So what you are seeing is we are able to recreate the painting of uh, the 17th century renowned painter Rembrandt. And this wouldn't have been possible without um, a. So, yeah, again, as you might recall from your earlier session, paintings are a subject matter of copyright law. So, if this particular painting was made by Rembrandt, yes, he would have received copyright protection over that particular painting. But yes, we know that this wasn't prepared by Rembrandt, so we do not know whether uh, there should be a copyright protection over that particular painting. Uh, the other example which I would like to share is that of BioU, which is actually writing its own code. So it's an AI program which is writing or producing code. So what it essentially does is, uh, it generally uses the codes which are posted on GitHub, which is an open access repository of, of their code. And through neural sketch learning, it associates an intent behind each of those codes. So when you or I search or request to produce an app, then it will try to match our request with the intent which they, it has already analyzed and then produce a new app or a new code. Again, if you may recall from your copyright related lesson, yes, if the software was produced by a human being, it is currently protected under copyright law, but here it's not uh, produced by a human being, but by an algorithm. So the question is whether we should grant copyright protection over that code which is produced by the algorithm. Moving away from those copyrightable outputs, maybe we can also look at the patented products or patentable products. So the example which I have shown in this screen is a patent which was issued last month to Google. And what is this patent doing? So it's interesting because as we all know, the doctors produce different clinical notes, right? And many a times these are like disconnected clinical notes. There might also be your um, all kinds of other data relating to your health, which will be going into the file of a uh, particular hospital. But this pattern says that these clinical notes can be processed using recurrent neural network and then it can produce a future health status of the patient. Or in other words, by analyzing the current clinical notes which you are having, it will be able to predict your future health. Again, this is being done by A. And as you can see from the pattern number as well as the patent data, yes, this has been patented by Google last month. So Google has got a patent. Uh, in the United States for this particular technology. So that's one area where you can see uh, how AI is excelling. Um, in general, across drug discovery, you can see an important role being played by AI. So in the current COVID context, you might be wondering how pharmaceutical companies are quickly coming up with results on saying, okay, drug A might be helpful in treating some symptoms of uh, COVID-19, or uh, it might be able to prevent the spread of this particular virus. So that part, that part is primarily played by A. So A can actually check and see whether any of the molecules can be a potential target for COVID-19. So as you can see from this particular article, which I have uh, put on the slide, A is currently being used in drug discovery, drug trials, and even in the context of the 
drug approval process. So at all stages of um, the development of a drug, now AA plays a very, very important role. Not surprisingly, we also see an increasing number of patent applications relating to AA uh, in different patent offices across the globe. So one of the data, again, I mean, this is not an official statistic, but one of the uh, law firms did uh, an analysis uh, wherein they could see that in the year 2019 alone, there were 3,000 plus US patents that were granted on technologies uh, wherein AI or machine learning was uh, used. So again, I re-emphasize these are not official statistics because no one has official data on how many AI-related uh, technologies are patented in US or India or whatever it might be. But at least these data show that there is an increasing trend from the side of them. Uh, firms to apply for patents wherein A is also a component. So that's something which you need to keep in mind. So if you look at the kind of examples which I mentioned earlier, and if you also recall the different discussions which you had in the last four days, you can easily identify that there are at least three important rights that can play an important role in the context of a they are copyright patents and trade secrets i do not know dr krishna did you also have a session on trade secrets or you didn't have one on uh, we secrets? did have we, we did have a resource person from intel but you okay. can you, uh, obviously if you wish you can extend on it no problem no no, no problem so i just want to yeah, if, if they have got a basic idea for trade secrets i think that's sufficient for our discussion today so at least as you can see and as you can recall from your earlier discussions, uh, the kind of outputs which we discussed earlier could be protected or can be protected under copyright patents or trade secrets. But the most important question which we will have to ask ourselves is whether there are any justification for grant of IP rights over A or the outputs generated by A. So for this, we'll have to look at the theoretical justification for intellectual property. So I know that Professor Jane had taken the introductory session for you on um, intellectual property, and I do not know whether he also touched upon the theories of IP, uh, but if not, don't worry, we'll have like a five minute quick uh, wrap up of uh, uh, what are the major theories or theoretical justifications for um, IP. So the most prominent or the most commonly used one is the so-called welfare theory, which is also known as the incentive theory. So it has its roots in the law and economics approach, and it primarily aims to achieve uh, maximum happiness for the maximum number, which is generally referred to as a uh, utilitarianism. So as we all know, most of the information would have the characteristics of what economics call us public goods. So there are two important public goods characteristics. One is they are non-rivalrous in consumption. For example, both you as well as I can consume a digital file at the same time. For example, both of us can listen to an Apple music at the same time. So unlike a tangible product, wherein only one person will be able to enjoy that particular product at one point of time, in the case of most of the digital goods, information products, what you are seeing is there is no rivalry in the character of consumption. More than one person, maybe thousands or millions can consume the same product at the same time. Secondly, it is also very difficult to exclude people from consuming these information products. Because of these characteristics, generally economists will say that most of the information goods will have the public goods characteristic. And one of the potential consequences of having this public good characteristic is that most of the innovators or creators will also see that, okay, the moment they produce a work, people are going to copy their work without giving them any remuneration. And according to economists, the net result will be that there will be underproduction of such information products. Or in other words, imagine that you are a musician. And if you know very clearly that the moment you produce a new musical work, people are going to copy it, the chances are very, very high that you won't produce the music in the first place or you won't share it with anyone. 
so that's not a really desirable result for the society right and because of that we have to find a solution and there are different solutions so one option would be the government providing the goods for example the government can pay money to you and then make it available for everyone um the related one is government subsidizing uh, it for you for example uh, in the context of covid 19 vaccine the government can say that okay the government will take care of 75% of the expenditures the firm will have to take only 25% in that case says again they have more motivation to come up with a drug for covid 19 the other option would be government can issue prices to successful private producers for example the indian government can today say that okay if someone is coming up with a covid 19 uh, vaccine which uh, is effective as well as which doesn't have any uh, negative consequences we will grant of uh, 500 crores yes that might be one option to incentivize people to produce that particular drug then yes there could also be some legal reinforcement of self help strategies for example in the context of music you can try to put anti circumvention measures for example if you look at most of the music today there are copy protection measures or if you look at most of the newspapers like times of india if you try to right click on the page you will see that copying is disabled and if the particular proprietor has put a measure like that the government can then yes give legal protection to those copy protection measures so that's one option but the most commonly adopted one the most commonly accepted one is the government granting an exclusive right to producers against competition or in other words through intellectual property rights what the government is saying is okay for a limited period of time in the context of it, uh, patents it will be 20 years we will protect you from competition and this is what the welfare theory is suggesting so according to welfare theory the most optimal approach to address the issue of under production of information goods is to grant these kinds of limited term monopolies for the producers of such goods so it can be copyrightable goods it can be patentable innovations but the basic point is that if you are giving these kinds of limited term monopoly then there might be incentives for production of such goods so this is the most prominent um, uh, theory which is used for justifying ip protection and you can see it being adopted in uh, countries across the globe there is also another cluster of theory which is known as uh, fairness theory some of you must have been familiar with the writings of uh, john law uh, who said that everyone has a natural right to the fruits of her or his intellectual labor so in the context of um, intellectual property we can say that if you as an author is producing an article you should have the natural right to protect that particular article similar is the case with music so if a roman is producing music a roman has mm-hmm. the natural right to protect that particular music from being copied so that's what the fairness theory is suggesting uh, a modified form of fairness theory is uh, known as equity theory which says that yes there should be rewards which are in proportion to the amount of contribution which is being made again that also sees application in some jurisdiction across the globe so that's the second cluster of uh, theory of intellectual property there is also a third cluster which is known as personality theory and it is based on the writings of uh, philosophers like kant and hegel which says that private property rights are required to satisfy some of the basic human needs and policy makers should try to create and allocate entitlement to resources so that people can fulfill those needs so that that was developed in the context of tangible or real property but when it comes to the intellectual property people said that we should see these intellectual works say for example music or an article which you produce as manifestations or extensions of your personality and if they are extensions of your personality then yes we need to protect them from others so again this is one of the important clusters of theories which is used for justifying the grant of intellectual property rights and you will see the personality theory having substantial influence in 
many countries in continental europe or in other words in many countries in continental europe when they give ip protection the theory which they use for justifying that grant of ip protection is personality theory whereas in countries like the united states you will see that it's mostly the welfare theory or the fairness theory which is used for granting or justifying the grant of ip protection then the last and final cluster of theory is culture theory which is also known as social planning theory here they do not justify uh, the grant of ip but what they are generally saying is how ip should be fine tuned so again if you look at this particular cluster you will notice that it is not based on the writings of one author but based on the writings of multiple authors like marx and kahneman bendler fisher etc and in a line what this particular cluster of theory is saying is that intellectual property rights can and should be shaped to help in fostering the achievement of a just and attractive culture of course i know that that sounds like a bit too complex but generally i mean to put it in more simpler words what they are essentially saying is that there exists something like human nature and it is blossoming under some conditions and what we need to do is we need to adapt our social and political institutions to facilitate that blooming and some of the conditions which are important in this regard is protection of life health possibilities of engagement protection of privacy etc and the proponents of this theory note that currently the access to these things are very limited and systematically unequal but we need to try to expand and to some degree equalize access and as you can imagine in the area of intellectual property it has very very important implications because it is demanding more access to ip products so that people will have better life better health better possibilities for engagement and even better protection of privacy rights so in general i would say that among the four clusters of theories the most important one which i as a student in this area uh, find the most interesting exciting and important for a country like india would be culture theory because it is demanding that we need to take steps to equalize access and this includes access to things like medicine or access to things like information products like books etc so again to summarize these are the four important clusters of theories which are used for justifying or fine tuning ip and now what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves whether any of these theories will support the grant of intellectual property rights over ai or whether it will grant the support of ip right to output generated by ai so here i must say that when it comes to the first question that is whether we should grant ip right over a things are relatively easy because as i mentioned at the beginning of this presentation at the end a is all about code and if those codes were written if the software was written by human being we have at least some sort of justification for granting ip right and as you can imagine generally the ip rights over those software will be given or will be vested on the people who authored the software that is the programmer so not much theoretical difficulty sir but the real complexity will be in cases wherein we have to ask ourselves whether we should grant ip rights to things which are generated by a for example earlier i showed you one of the ai program which is writing its own code so when an ai is writing its own code should ip protection be granted to that particular code which was written by ai to me 
none of the theories which we discussed so far is supporting the grant of ip rights to the a again i reemphasize i would agree that we might grant ip rights to the programmer who created a for that particular a but if a is generating output say for example music or say for example painting or for example um an innovation like a drug we don't need grant ip right or the current theories of intellectual property rights do not support the grant of ip rights to uh a any questions on that front and i hope you are all able to distinguish between the two any question hello yes yeah i'm then enjoy singh so yes. uh, the the ai and ml systems are based on data so those yes. data uh, mm -hmm. because data is the prerequisite for an ai or ml system to function Absolutely. so these uh, these data come with uh, their own proprietary uh, things so how are Absolutely. we catering with those uh, ipr rights associated with the data which has been mined in order uh, so, for the ai or ml machine to be trained to give some sense about Sanjay, I guess you are from the computer science background, right? If I understand correctly. Yeah, yeah, fairly. Oh, excellent. So that's a very, very brilliant question, Sanjay. So in general, one of the things which you should um, know is that there is no copyright in data as such. But the problem lies in considering what exactly should be considered data. For example. if uh, the particular a is generating painting from different paintings that are already existing maybe that the different paintings that are already existing are the ones that are considered a right so those paintings as dhananjay was rightly pointing out would be under or can be under copyright protection but then how do we deal with that particular issue so my position on that particular front which you will also see at a later point of time is that if a particular a is using a particular copyrightable work only for the purpose of mining and learning from that particular work then there should be an exception to infringement of copyright in that particular work and this is not something new which i am proposing some of the countries have already taken steps in this particular i do not know whether you had a discussion as part of your copyright session on this particular issue but if you look at for example a country like uk they have a very very specific exception for text and data mining but in the indian context we don't have a very specific exception for text and data mining so i have written a blog post so if you want you can also search um on google uh you can just search with the keywords copyright icip arul um, and then text and data mining um uh, in that blog post i have argued that even our copyright law is providing sufficient flexibilities in this regard because we have something called a fair dealing exception and to me as a student of law who is working in this area fair dealing can address this issue to some extent but i clarify that the better option would be the legislators coming forward and saying that okay we also need to have a very specific exception for text and data mining so dhananjay thank you so much for asking that question it is a very very important question so in the case of many data which the ai might be relying on yes there might be an issue of copyright infringement and we as a country has to address that particular issue and my general position is that if the data is used only for the purpose of training ai or for learning purpose of the ai then yes that use should not be considered as a copyright infringement because the future it is going to be dependent on different ai applications and we need to facilitate that we will also see some of the other reasons later why i am demanding this but at least uh, in the specific context of the question which dhananjay was asking this is very very 
Any other question? Okay. If there are no other questions, yes, uh, is someone having a question? So there is a small issue. So since my PPT is on my screen, I'm not able to see who is asking the question. So please feel free to uh, let me know. Okay. Okay. So I presume that there are no questions, other questions at this stage. So if that's the case, let's look at the next slide. So if uh, uh, no, Professor yeah. Arun, sorry to yes. uh, jump in between. No, I think there was a very sh uh, short question. Yes, I think no. I I would uh, pass it to you. Yes. Somebody asked it. Uh, just let me get to it. Hello, Dr. Prasad. Uh, can you ask a question? Yeah, yeah. I think I'll have to locate it. I'm sorry. You please carry on. I'll get back to you. Okay, sure. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay. So, if in any case. Some of you think that pattern protection should be given to A, then there are some important questions that we will have to ask. So I know that you had a session on patterns, so I'm sure that you have already gone through the essential elements of patternability. So in the context of A, we will have to ask some questions. So the most important one will be, can A be considered as an inventor for the purpose of pattern law? The answer is not easy. And as I can show you from a decision of the UK High Court, again, that came only last month, in the case of Stephen Taylor versus the Control General of Patent Designs and Trademarks, the answer is no. So, in this particular case, Dr. Stephen Taylor, who works in the area of artificial intelligence, had filed two patent applications in UK. One was relating to a particular food container, and the, the second one was relating to a search and rescue uh, beacon. So when he filed the patent application, what he did was he left the inventor column blank, and he did it intentionally because he thought that this particular invention was created by an A called Dabas, and he didn't play an important role in the creation of that particular invention. So he thought that it is morally inappropriate to name himself as the inventor. So what he did was he filed an application without naming the inventor. But the application was filed by he himself, Dr. Stephen Taylor. So when the UK Patent Office received the application, they said that, OK, we have received your application, but there is a small problem. You need to file the details of the inventor as per Section 7 of the UK Patents Act. But if you are looking at a similar provision in the Indian Patents Act, you will have to look at Section 6, which is talking about the person entitled to apply for patent. So here, at this particular point, Dr. Please Peter, mute your mic. Dr. Ruchira. So, Dr. Taylor filed a detailed response to UK IPO saying that, okay, he read the Patents Act, but according to him, inventorship is not confined to natural person. There was a reason for saying that because nowhere in the UK Patent Statute, or for that matter, even in our Patents Act 1970, we don't say anywhere that machines cannot how or cannot be an inventor in a pattern. So we don't say that. But we use the term persons when it comes to the provision on patents or, or who can actually file them, persons entitled to apply for patents. So if I may read the specific statutory provision which we have, uh, it reads as follows. So subject to the provisions contained in section 134, an application for a patent for an invention may be made by any of the following persons that is to say, A, by any person claiming to be the true and first inventor of the invention, B, by any person being the assignee of the person claiming to be the true and first inventor in respect of the right to make such an application, C, by the legal representative of any deceased person who immediately before his death was entitled to make such an application. So the UK provision is also somewhat similar. 
and because of that the uk ipo replied to dr tedo that davos is a mission and because it is a mission we cannot consider it as an inventor under the provisions of patents act 1977 in the uk the uk ipo officer also mentioned that only a person can be an inventor of course dr taylor wasn't very happy about that and he filed an appeal or he appealed against this decision before the high court and in a decision which was rendered by justice marcus smith in the in uh, september on uh, that is last year it was clarified that in the uk a patent could only be granted to a person and that's primarily because there is an established principle that only a person can hold property rights and after my from your previous sessions patents are also property rights so even though they are intangible property they are considered as property rights so it can be so if it is the one of the important consequence of being a property rights is that you can own it you can transfer it you can assign it you can license it etc right and if that is the case yes it can only be granted to a natural person according to the uk decision so with respect to the first answer itself i will have to say that in general if i look at the position in uk or in india the answer would be negative so an a cannot be an inventor so if a cannot be an inventor and if only human beings can be considered as an inventor then there is another issue so which human being should be considered as the inventor so should it be the person who is owning the a system or should it be the person who coded the a system again that's a very very complicated question and as you can again learn from the theories of ip in general only human beings would be supported for ownership also so again we have a serious issue there are also other questions for example in the context of patent law you might have learned that among the three requirements of patentability the most important one and the most difficult one is the requirement of inventive step or non obviousness right and generally as you might have learned there the question of whether there is an inventive step or whether the work was non obvious is assessed from the perspective of a person skilled in the art person who is working in that area so if a engaging or if a is filing a patent application the question would be who should be considered as a person skilled in the art and if a is a person who is considered as a person skilled in the art the there is a high probability that nothing would be non obvious to the a again so that means the requirement of or one of the most important requirements of patentability will not be met then in the context of patents you must have also learned that there is a disclosure requirement right so if you want to get patent protection you have to disclose your invention in the best possible manner but in the context of a this is again very very difficult so if you are talking about a particularly uh, systems that you deep learning wherein the system is working on its own it is only a black box for the world. because we generally do not have very clear explanation on why that particular a produced that particular output so it's generally a black box which means we will not also be able to meet the disclosure requirement since an autonomous a is also engaging in automated innovation it is also very difficult to precisely draft the claim again that's a big challenge which we will have to deal with in the context of a then yes there are also some other questions should there be mandatory disclosure of the training data with as part of the pet application because if you really want to know how they is working it is also important to know what data is related on 
So how do we address this issue of this closure? Of course, one of the options would be mandating public disclosure. Of course, we can discuss that in the uh, concluding part. Finally, there is also a question of infringement by A. So as you might have learned from your session on patent, patent infringement is a strict liability. So imagine that the A inventor is engaging in innovation and in that process violating the patent rights of others, then the question is, who should be held responsible for that infringement? Can A be held responsible for infringement of patents? So these are some of the inevitable questions which we will have to ask in the context of giving or granting patent protection for artificial intelligence. Now, uh, yes, I see, yes. Now in the context of copyright also, there are similar challenges existing. So if you look at the examples which we uh, discussed earlier, where you saw different outputs being produced by A, you can see that generally they were happening in three steps. So first step is someone is writing the A code, and that's primarily done by human programmers, so there are no major difficulties. So we can grant copyright protection for those codes, and generally that co protection is granted to human programmers. But step two is a more challenging one. So if you are relying on machine learning from data, and that's from data set, and if you are following the subset of machine learning, which is known as deep learning, wherein the A is autonomously engaging in the learning process, then it is very evident that it is at least one degree removed from the human programmers, right? So in such a context, when a work is produced, say for example, a music or a literary work is produced, who should be considered as the author of that particular work? Can A be considered as the author of that particular work for the purpose of copyright law? Again, the answer is very difficult. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no countries or no courts across the world have addressed that issue directly. But there are some cases from related areas which might be helpful for us. Uh, some of you might be talking, there was a very famous chimpanzee uh, selfie case, right? So there was a monkey that took a selfie and then there was a copyright dispute over that particular picture. The picture is the one which you are seeing on your screen currently. So in this particular case, which went on in appeal before the court of circuits for the ninth circuit in the united states in the year 2018 the court very clearly said that a monkey cannot own copy right so in other words the court has clarified at least under the u.s copyright law only human beings can be an author of a copyrightable work and I don't see any reason why the Indian copyright law would also take a different position in this particular regard. So again, the answer from the copyright perspective is that A may not be considered or cannot be considered as an author as per our current copyright law uh, standard. The other issue which we again have to discuss is in copyright law, as you might have learned from your session on copyright, the only requirement for copyright protection is that you need to meet the requirements of originality. And in general, the standards of originality is very low. So as long as you haven't copied uh, the work from anyone uh, else, generally you will be able to get copyright protection over the works which you create. For example, when you are scribbling notes on your computer from this particular lecture, you are automatically becoming the copyright owner over that particular note or if you are taking pictures of your kids or the nature, whatever it might be, you are automatically becoming the copyright owner over that particular. And that's because of the low standards of originality which the copyright system have accepted across the world. But when A is engaging in production of copyrightable works, we might have to rethink the originality standards also. And in general, I mean, if at all we are going for copyright protection for works generated by A, 
my job uh, view is that we need to raise the standards of co uh, originality so that only very few work enter into copyright protection otherwise we will not be able to use any of the works which are produced by uh, a so that's something which you need to uh, remember finally in this section maybe we should also look at the arguments which are generally generated in favor of granting ip protection as well as the arguments which are generally against granting ip protection so if you look at the arguments in favor of granting ip protection the most important argument or the most frequently seen argument is that a machines are generating value and at least someone should be able to capture it but what they generally don't tell us is who should be able to or who should be allowed to capture this value should it be the owner of the machine or should it be the society in general to me we need to allow the society to capture the value of a generated work and that can only be done by keeping the works in public domain the other argument which is made in favor of granting ip protection is that in the absence of ip protection there will not be balanced competition between human created and machine created output so if the human created works are under ip protection it is quite natural that they would be having higher prices and if they are have to compete with machine produced works which are uh, available for free the proponents of this argument say that there will be distortion in competition but again this is not a very valid argument because as you can see even today there are many products which are available for free which are competing with ip protected products for example many of the products uh, medicinal products which are under patent protection will be competing with generic drugs which are outside uh, patent protection same is the case with respect to copyrightable products so many of the pictures which you might be seeing will be which are under copyright protection will be competing with which are with pictures which are outside copyright uh, protection so that's again something which you need to remember uh, thirdly some of the proponents uh, of uh, for granting ip protection say that see we are already granting proxy authorship for copyright purposes for example uh, when a particular producer is producing a movie we are granting or we are uh, considering that producer as the author of that particular movie right and we also have the so called work for hire doctrine which is granting the ownership over certain works on firms and so on so they are saying why can we extend it to the a uh, context also let's now see the arguments against granting ip protection so here the most important argument which you need to be aware of is that throughout the history if you look at all the ip protection be it copyright or be it patent you will see that humans have played the central role in this ip regime for example if you look at the history of copyright you can see that the idea of authorship has established deep linkages between author and the work of course the notion of authorship has got diluted over in the postmodern era wherein we can see that the romanticized version of authorship uh, has gone away because people have realized that no one is working or producing anything in vacuum everything is collaborative in character we all are building upon uh, the ideas of so many other people including say for example my presentation here uh, but still we still haven't seen an argument that trees detached from this human centered role on copyright and patent law secondly and more importantly across the world the primary argument for granting ip protection has been that in the absence of ip protection there is no incentive to produce an innovative or a creative product but do the machines really need any incentives for protection so in general you will notice that machines cannot be incentivized to ip protection like copyright or patent so there is hardly any incentive justification for granting ip protection to ai for the outputs generated by ai some of the scholars also point out that if you are granting ip protection then we might be over rewarding the programmers because at the end it is they who might be trying to capture this ip protection which we are granting to aa and this is again unjustifiable because 
most of the times if a machine is engaging in deep learning the results are unforeseeable or unpredictable and then there is no justification for granting copyright or patent protection over those outputs to these programmers because they were completely unforeseeable or unpredictable some of the scholars also uh, highlight that work for hire doctrine has very limitations in the ai context because if you look at the work for hire doctrine in all such cases the essential work is being created by human being it is just getting transferred to a legal person but what we are talking in the ai context is the work is produced by machine and then we are demanding that it should be transferred to human being and that's generally not in combat uh, it's generally not compatible with the work for hire doctrine last but not the least if you look at any of the ip rights or rights in any manner you will see that they are often coming with certain responsibilities also for example if i am granting copyright protection to dr krishna then there is also a set of responsibilities which are vested on dr krishna for example if she is engaging in um uh, copyright infringement or if she is engaging in say for example uh, tarnishment of the reputation of someone then yes she would be liable for copyright infringement as well as libel but in the context of a who will take the responsibilities so will the programmers take the responsibilities will the owners take the responsibilities these are also unanswered questions so in this context also generally the argument is that please don't go for granting rights if you cannot also fix the responsibilities and so far we haven't seen any concrete steps when it comes to responsibilities so we should not also be granting rights the third and the final section i know that i have only like now 5 uh, to 10 minutes more that uh, will quickly wrap up the third and final session uh, or the interface is that ip can also act as an obstacle for innovation and transparency in a and this discussion next is relevant because today a is used not just for creativity and innovation but also for decision making that can affect our lives and our freedom for example in the united states a is routinely used for deciding on sentencing so imagine that uh, a court finds you guilty of murder the court can today use a for determining whether you should be given life imprisonment or you should be given death sentence if a is used for decision making that can affect the freedom of lives of people or if it is used in the detection of crime and so on then we should also understand that there will be a huge cost humans will have to pay if we lack transparency in a in the united states already many scholars have pointed out that many of the ai system that have been used for sentencing have clear tendencies of bias in the us context the bias is generally against the black people so if it is a black man who is in front of the ai the chances of the ai handing over a higher prison term or higher punishment are much higher and this is not surprising because at the end all these a are also initially coded by human beings so their bias will certainly be reflecting in the a also and if you are granting ip rights particularly if you are granting trade secret protection over the data sets which dhananjay pointed out earlier then there is a very very high chance that there will be serious hindrances of transparency so ip can act as a serious hindrance to transparency in the context of competition law we have also seen that algorithms are often used by firms for collusion for example uh, i think from tomorrow onwards there is this great um, sale going on in amazon and flipkart right at least some of you must have noticed that many a times the prices of products are very similar on both the platforms initially i thought that okay different individual programmers might be sitting and, and then checking okay 
what is the price of this product on amazon and then i will set my price on flipkart sorry that's not the way it's working today machines are doing it so algorithms are generally engaging in this price setting and at times algorithms can also engage in collusion if the owners of these systems want so the algorithms can be coded in such a manner to decide that okay <laughs> if the price of product x on platform a is going below a certain level the price on that particular product in my platform will also go to that particular level in that way it can engage in collusion and these kinds of collusions are prohibited under competition law but if you don't have access to the algorithm if you don't have access to the underlying data set then there are serious harm for competition in the market and if you are granting ip protection for a then there is a very very high chance that it will defeat dynamic efficiency that is competition based on innovation so that's a very very important thing that needs to be taken into consideration next to summarize so i know that i have taken up more or less uh, my complete time to summarize if you ask me about what position we should take um about the interface of ip and a the most important thing which you as researchers which you as teachers need to remember is that ip protection always involves certain social costs because they are granting monopoly right and because they are involving social costs we need to constantly remind ourselves that if the ip rights are not clearly providing a benefit then there is hardly any justification for the social cost imposed by ip protection and as i discussed earlier since machines are not influenced by incentives there is hardly a social benefit that is coming because of the ip protection which we are granting over the outputs which are autonomously generated by a i reemphasize here i am not talking about protection over a but i am talking about protection over outputs generated by a the second point is that if we really want to make ip protection for outputs generated by a then at least we should try to make it contingent on the human input linkage so if a particular a is producing without any human interference or without any human input then there should not be any um ip protection but on the other hand if the a is producing outputs based on the inputs given or based on human guidance then yes maybe we can grant ip protection over such output uh, thirdly if you are granting patent protection for outputs generated by a then we should also ensure that our patent systems have strong disclosure requirements and we should definitely mandate public deposit of algorithms as well as the training data set and it's not that difficult because already in the field of biotechnology we have mandated public deposit of the organisms and so on so if you are extending it in the context of a we can certainly demand the public deposit of algorithms and training data sets last but not the least as i responded uh, earlier to dhanandeep's question since a would be relying considerably on data sets it is also very very important to ensure that we include specific exceptions under our copyright law to enable text and data mining so these are the most important uh, things which i thought i should share uh, with all of you i know that i have provided more questions than answers um, in this particular regard but i would be only really happy to take um, some of uh, your questions so that we can engage in further discussions on this topic thank you all for your very very patient listening Okay, thank you, Dr. Arul. I wouldn't say that uh, you have left us with a question. You've actually stirred thinking process, and that has been a really excellent presentation from your side. And I, secondly, uh, ditto the points raised by the uh, participants that uh, there was a lot of clarity in whatever you expressed. 
and this is such a fluid it is in such a fluid state that uh, reasoning questioning ambiguity are bound to happen so now i can share some questions and then i'll also unmute the participants in case they want to interact one to one with you so over to one question that is about how do we place github and open apis ecosystem vis-a-vis -vis iprs this is again from dhananjay Yes, so Dhananjay, again, um, a very, very um, important question. So, uh, you know, yes, GitHub is an open repository, so there are no IP-related issues there. But you raise a very important um, question in the context of API. And I must say that currently, uh, in the United States, we are seeing a litigation before the U.S. Supreme Court on whether um, IP rights should be granted over API, and that's the most specific case of Google versus Oracle. So I would um, uh, strongly recommend all of you to also follow the discussions on that. So the oral hearings uh, are continuing in that particular uh, case. In general, my position is that uh, copyright should not be granted over APA because people should have access to APA and generally APA have functional character and so we should not be granting copyright or IP protection over APA. Uh, so that's the position which Google has taken in uh, that particular uh, litigation, but we'll have to wait and see how the U.S. Supreme Court deals with this particular issue. In the Indian context, we haven't seen a litigation uh, in this particular regard. But again, I hope uh, that we will have more clarity in this particular regard in the uh, coming days. Thanks uh, again for that excellent question. Okay, Prabhakar uh, is another participant who asked, any free website for patent searching that uses AI? Ha, huh, that's a good question. I think almost every um, independent patent databases are using some sort of AI. So, for example, on Google Patents, I do not know how many of you have searched Google Patents. As far as I understand, they also use to some extent um, uh, AI because we have to convert it from natural language to the machine language, right? So, many of them use it. So, I think you can start with Google Patents and you can also try um, the EPO and USPTO websites, because as far as I understand, they also use AI to a great extent in producing uh, the best results for all of us. So I have only two questions in the chat. Now, if anybody wishes to interact directly with him, kindly do so. I have unmuted you. Okay, in US, AI is routinely used in sentencing. Can you please expound? Expand. Okay, yeah. So as I tried to mention towards the end part of my presentation, in the United States, the courts are using A extensively. More specifically, uh, in the United States, uh, once a court finds that a person is guilty of a particular crime, then the court will have to decide how much imprisonment or what kind of punishment should be given to that particular person who has been uh, convicted for that particular offense and there the courts are using a and the the a will be looking at the different characteristics of the crime the a will also be looking at the profile of the particular uh, person and then tell the judge okay this is a punishment that needs to be given for this particular person. The problem is, as I mentioned earlier, in many cases, the scholars have found that the punishments that were handed out by A were very different for the white persons and black persons. So if you are a black person, if you are a male, then there is a very, very high chance that you will get a bigger punishment. And that's because most of the AA programs are coded by white males. So if the program is coded by a white male, there is a very, very high chance that the biases which are, which are inherent in that particular white male will also reflect in the A which he or she produced. And because of that, bias is seen in sentencing. And there is a lot of discussion that is currently happening in the United States on the remedial steps that need to be taken in this regard. But unfortunately, the US is again having a racist, uh, I might call it bluntly, racist president at the moment. So we are not seeing much changes happening. But I truly hope that 
uh, changes will be made in this particular regard, particularly uh, to make um, the AI systems and the underlying data sets more transparent. In the Indian context also, um, our government is also suggesting that, okay, we need to use more and more AI for different types of decision making. So this issue is going to come to India also very, very soon. So unless and until we have transparency in AI and the underlying data sets, we will see very, very biased results coming from the AI decision making process. I hope this is clarified. Okay, there's just a sequel to the same question which says whether it will include demographic background of the under trial. This is in context to what you were discussing right now. Absolutely. So the demographic of the underlying under trial will have a very, very big impact in this particular regard. For example, if you are a black person, the chances of you getting a parole are much lesser as compared to the same kind of crime committed by a white person in the United States. Of course, even in the among the judges also, you can see this bias, but when it comes to the mission, it is just getting more and more amplified. So the issues are even worse on there. Next is from Salja. She says, I think ethical aspects of AI should also be considered as the situation may arise like Chitti in Robert 2 movie. What's your take, sir? Who will have to decide on this aspect? <laughs> very, very important um, uh, question. Again, um, uh, the government should actually initiate discussions on having an ethical framework for AI. Unfortunately, uh, we don't see that kind of a discussion emerging in the Indian context. So if you look at um, the other global... Um, uh, Facebook say, has you know, initiated a project. Exactly. Facebook. But again, the problem is Facebook is one of the biggest contributors to bias and bias decisions. right? <laughs> so, um, But uh, yes, everyone is aware of the fact that there is a problem, uh, but we are still not seeing that much of a... Uh, coordinated effort coming from the side of all the stakeholders. So uh, yes, um, private players like Facebook, Google, etc. can uh, play an important role. But I do have a feeling the state and also the public, particularly the civil society organizations have a very, very important role here because we need to be more and more vigilant now because our life is getting more and more decided by yeah, just to give you another example, I think if you have applied for a credit card or if you have applied for a loan, you now know that uh, it is decided by civil scores, right? But I do not know how many of you have tried to challenge a civil score. It's going to be a very, very difficult task. So again, if such a decision making is done by A, so if A is deciding whether you should be granted a loan, whether you should be granted a credit card, then yes, we we have the right to know under what circumstances the particular AA made a particular decision on your application. So be it uh, relating to your freedom, be it relating to your um, economic activities, uh, AA is playing an important role. And like the Chitti, uh, yes, we, Chitti in, uh, I think, what was the movie? I forgot the movie name, uh, the Renaissance movie. I know which one you are referring to. Uh, like that, yes, we need to evolve an, a proper ethical framework in the decision making. OK, any more questions? So can I put in one or two questions to you, Dr. Arul? I too have some Absolutely. interest in it. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I, I am also working in this area. In fact, everybody is trying their hands in this area. So uh, recently I had a paper I think I mentioned to you, the conference which we missed out, which will be happening okay. next year. That's so true, yeah. in that I'm working on a paper. I'm still working on it. So. Could you comment on the purchasing behavior or the impact of AI on purchasing behavior in context of trademarks? Ah, in the context of trademark. Uh, so can you also please elaborate a bit on what are the key um, uh, issues that were coming to your mind? Because unfortunately, okay, yes. I didn't get a chance to see your paper. See, what, so. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to tackle is that uh, in that I have raised questions that initially people used to decide on their own about the brands. Now they're taking a lot of help of things like Alexa. So how the decision, uh, it's an AI related operated decision oh, that's on a, the behalf of the very, customers. Very, very important question, um, uh, Dr. Krishna. So again, I mean, if I look so this at this is a part of my paper. Uh, oh, excellent, excellent. So I really look forward to reading that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm paper. still doing so, research on that, but I'd love to hear from you. 
Yeah, so again, I mean, the best example that comes to my mind is uh, Amazon and Flipkart. So if I search yes. on Amazon, for example, for uh, a brand like Nike, the chances are very high that the AI will not be showing the Nike products first, but the product which Amazon wants to show. So there the AI is actually making a decision based on the input which I give. Of course, the input which I give is a trademark that is Nike. But mm -hmm. the AI is taking a decision uh, which is giving an output which is totally different from what I want. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. output has a huge, huge impact on my purchasing behavior. For example, if I am not going to see the Nike product in the first 10 pages of uh, Amazon, mm -hmm. the chances are very high that I will just go with the product which I saw on the first page of Amazon. And exactly. many research have shown that people generally tend to not go beyond the first one or two pages in a search result. So that means my purchasing behavior is getting influenced by an AA which is being deployed by Amazon or Flipkart or for that matter, Google. So yes, there are serious issues and we need to address uh, these uh, issues. So um, as you might be aware of, um, we had already one case that came up uh, before the competition commission, the Google um, uh, case, wherein Bharat Matrimony had raised this particular issue in the context of Google search. So if someone is searching Bharat Matrimony, Google won't uh, show Bharat Matrimony first, but Google will show the people who paid Google first. So again, I mean, the, the problem here is A is picking up the uh, results which need to be shown and it has huge impact on consumer consumption. And so we need to uh, at least raise these questions and uh, make these platforms accountable for the results which they show. So thank, thank you for uh, raising that, and I really look forward to reading the paper. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions? Colleagues, do you want to have, do you have any more questions or else we'll wrap up? I know everyone needs a tea break now. Yeah, it has been uh, a long it's not time. A, it's not a tea break. It's not a tea break. Let me mention you've got a lot of compliments also. You can read it later on in the chat. Oh, I mean, if there so is a lot of clarity in the session and in the topic explanation, obviously people will not have too many questions. That's a really good compliment. <laughs> so, and I, I you, also sir. thoroughly You're enjoyed it. Thank See, you, it's thank still you. coming. It was interesting, sir. In fact, all the sessions, they are liking it very much because it, every it is, session has it been is. very interactive. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Arul. Uh, indeed, you are working in a very, very interesting area. I mean, every day it is filling up something new or the other. So it's a very stimulating and challenging to our mind. And thanks for giving your time and enlightening the audience. I hope they'll be able to use this information further in the research and teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishna, and I look forward to interacting okay. with all of you in the future. Yeah. And please feel Definitely. free to email me if you have any uh, further questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Bye. thank you so much. Bye. Thanks.